Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. And also in Nordic mythology, uh, the world would be explained, also the creation of the world would be explained by the sky being the dwarf's helmet and the, the, uh, the, uh, the oceans being the blood of the giant or something. So I thought I wanted to bring some kind of those explanations, kind of, kind of some flavor of that into the story. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 57, where we can finally start complaining about the heat instead of the cold. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured, or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Andre Snyer Magnuson about his book, The Casket of Time. Andre Snyer Magnuson is an Icelandic writer, poet, and filmmaker. Author of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and his newest, The Casket of Time, he's the winner of the Philip K. Dick Special Citation and has won the Icelandic Literary Award in all categories. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, John Monaster. Very excited to be here today in person. Uh, with Andre Magnusson, author of The Casket of Time. Andre, say hello. Hello. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And honored so, to be here. Yeah, so glad to have you. Uh, I'm so glad to be put in touch with another great Restless Books author. Thank you. I really Thanks appreciate... For reading my book. Yeah, of course. Appreciate everything you're doing, and um, I thought it was a really fun and, and thoughtful book. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to talk with you about it. Um, and I think really, I always like to start off with just kind of a summary in your own words. What, what's the book all about? What's The Casket of Time? Well, The Casket of Time, you could say, is about a mad king that has conquered the world, but he thinks it's really unfair that he doesn't get more time than mm. other people. And he has accomplished everything and uh, done everything succeeded as much as is possible and he has taken care that nothing happens to his beautiful princess but uh, he doesn't have more time than others and that's of course quite tragic and uh, he understands that everything he has accomplished will be taken away by the vicious time his beautiful princess she will just grow old and die like she was a common worthless peasant and he thinks this is unfair and he demands a solution but of course nobody can help him and all sorts of people come that claim they can preserve eternity in a poem or a statue or a plastic surgeons or whatever but he throws everyone to the lions because they don't have the real solution but then one day some dwarves come and they have something that looks like a glass casket but it's actually not made of glass it's woven with spider silk and it's so densely woven that time cannot penetrate the walls so when the king closes the casket and the princess is inside and he opens an hour a week a month later she only feels like one second past mm -hmm. So the king, had, he can remove all the unimportant moments from her life. Like we spend our tragic lives on Mondays, for example. You know, one-seventh of our life. Yeah. Just on Mondays, ruthlessly. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and February's, you know, 
even though it's a short month, it's, it's they're not not all worth living. And Januarys and uh, you know some political turmoil years, like uh, you know not everybody's happy having spending four 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 years on Trump, and uh, you know so people kind of uh, are forced to waste their lives on all sorts of times that they wish were better. So the king can give the princess only the time that is really worth living, mm -hmm. only the Instagram moments of life. And this works well to begin with, but slowly she becomes so precious, so holy, that it takes two years to prepare the perfect day in her life that runs seamlessly from morning to evening after a great opening ceremony. And one day a boy breaks into the castle and he's going to steal her necklace and she finds out that she's been 20 years in the casket, the king has gone mad, the kingdom is crumbling and he's not going to open until the world is perfect. But of course the world is never perfect so she yeah. makes a deal with the boy that he shall come once on every full moon, open the casket, tell her a story, help her to find a way back into real time. So that is one level of the story. And then there's like a frame story, which happens in our times when some magical tech company seems to have stumbled upon the same invention as these spider silk caskets and you can put them together with a hex key, like an IKEA cabinet, and uh, everybody gets one, and the world starts going wrong. <laughs> right, right, as you can imagine might happen. Yeah, of course, otherwise, We could all freeze ourselves. Otherwise, yeah. it wouldn't be a story. That's right, <laughs> that's just, right, things have to happen. That's what the author has to do. He has to make something yeah. go wrong. That's right. Well, I think you did it in a very interesting way, right? I, liked, I really enjoyed the idea of the frame, um, and helping, I think it was a great way to help people connect to the story a bit, as opposed to sort of throwing them in a fable. They could see, oh, okay, here's how this fable might play out in our world. You know, I yeah, I wanted was to make like some kind of two-level. Uh, I was even thinking of a trilogy or something, mm -hmm. but but uh, you know, one 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 level is our time mm -hmm. with it, this invention. One level is the fable level. The uh, the kingdom mm -hmm. in one level would be may maybe a mid middle level but but actually I like more dense books you know I like books that are just basically dense yeah. in, in concept mythology is always dense mythology that has lived the longest mm. uh, and fables like about King Midas or you know all these yeah. stories Aesop. none yeah. of them is like a trilogy <laughs> all of them are like quite dense and they have all lived for thousands of years so so what do you mean when you say dense i mean like uh if ideas in a story are like alcohol in a drink mm. or or like uh, a concentration of cof coffee then uh, i prefer stories that are more like tequila mm -hmm. than beer that is uh, I see. instead of five percent ideas Right, and the rest is like water, like w lots of words, <laughs> endless words. Right, uh, I like when uh, something kind of startles me at least twice or three times on a yeah. page. Maybe it's an attention disorder or something, but but I just like you crave it. I, yeah. I like the juice, and also it's in poetry too. So I yeah. I think I learned this from to appreciate this both from science and poetry. Hmm. That is when you see a beautiful equation in science and you see how they have carved out all of the kind of non-essentials just to give mm -hmm. you the core right and that core explains the world also in poetry they just take out as many words as possible until yeah. you have like the exactly the, the essence yeah so i like books that are more like the essence mm, that and, makes sense but of course they have to hang together on something but yeah uh, that's my approach to writing, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for a little bit before we delve into the, the content, the, the story that you just described. How did you, how did you approach writing the book? How did you actually sit down and, and make the book happen? So my writing background is, is quite uh, broad, or uh, 
scattered or diverse, it mm -hmm. depends on how you frame it. So I started with poetry and uh, then I did a children's book called The Story of the Blue Planet. People actually wanted another children's book because that one has been published in 35 languages. So Wow, congratulations. Uh, thank you. So it was kind of natural to follow up and, and get another book into that circuit. But my next book was sci-fi that children can't understand, mm -hmm. which is a book called Love Star. And that one won the uh, Philip K. Dick Award here in the States. Yeah. So it would have been natural to follow up on that. But then things in Iceland, because I write in Icelandic and mm -hmm. I belong to that Icelandic society, uh, things were getting quite wrong. There were beautiful areas in the highlands of Iceland under attack, mm. going to be dammed by multinational corporations. And I thought it would, that cause was actually more, that is, the greatest nesting place of pink footed geese in the world mm. was endangered. Wow. They were going to flood that area with a dam to make aluminum. And, and, and I thought this was going so much against all my values and everything that I believed in that I actually ask, asked myself, why creating beauty or, or art into a society that is destroying something that is so far more important than anything that anyone can create? Hmm. So I thought if I could prevent that or take part in the movement that would prevent that, then I would have left something more valuable than any work of art. Hmm. So my next book was Dreamland, which is a non-fiction book. So suddenly I had poetry, uh, children's book, science fiction, science fiction and, and yeah. non-fiction, and then some plays. And then the next thing I did was a documentary film, actually, which was also Dreamland, hmm. but quite different uh, from the book. So after a long period of activism, which is a quite uh, kind of, uh, it, it, it takes lots of energy. And of course you meet lots of people, you, you learn a lot about power structures and uh, economy and you know, PR and uh, lobbyism and, and basically all of the big forces that are- Yeah, sort uh, of secretly shape our world. Yes. Or not so, so, so you get a, sometimes. get a very valuable insight into things. Yeah. Then I was so totally drained by anger or, or like, you know, th this urge of, of, uh, of a cause. And then the Icelandic economy collapsed in a dramatic way. And I just had this huge urge to go back to fantasy mm. uh, and imaginative creativity uh, of that realm. But of course, I was bringing lots of the stuff that I was describing into the book. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's definitely shown in the book in, in both levels. You know, you see sort of uh, the best in people and you see the worst in people. You see the, the ways in which our society today has kind of led us down a dangerous path and how people try and escape it and, you know, things aren't so simple. Yeah, and maybe um, some in some way I just wish that I had a time casket so I didn't have to go through that uh, worrying. <laughs> but but then the message is also if uh, nobody tries to make the world better, then the world actually doesn't get better. Right. We have to. We can't abdicate our individual responsibilities. You can't. You, know. you can't wait for things to get better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have the, to. You do have it. to make things better. Yeah. Which is actually what humans are quite uh, faced with now with the newest yeah. United Nations reports. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what part of what makes this so powerful is that message resonates for both children and adults that read the book in different ways, I think. And I think that's why the book is so great because it can it can appeal to people at different age levels and help them understand that sort of core truth. Mm -hmm. My aim in kind of both of my children's books, which is the story of the blue planet and this one, Casket of Time, this one is maybe a bit more dense than the the blue planet. I, I really adore kind of the children's classics that are actually not for a certain age group, but uh, books that you grab maybe in your 20s and you 
you find something in the in the book that you actually you recalled something as a child or you you feel there was something installed in your mind but but then you come back to the book so so the children's book as an art form like a serious art form yeah uh, i really respect or i'm really uh, kind of looking into those books you know you could say alice in wonderland or uh, or uh, charlotte's web or uh, you know those books that have themes and concepts that just they just really uh, stick in you, mm-hmm. and uh, and of course I respect the children's book maybe as a entertainment or just pure reading experiences. But I I I write a children's book more out of some kind of an urge <laughs> rather yeah. than than and and that's why I had to uh, or and or actually I think it's difficult to write in general. I don't. I don't kind of blurb out a book every year. Mm. So it always takes me like a year to kind of create the book in my mind. And it has to come out and it and I have to create this kind of gravity where the book and the cause or the theme of the book is kind of the most important thing that I could do because I think actually anything but writing I, I feel is easier. Mm. So so the first draft comes and then I can take like a, a whole year writing the first draft and then I have something that looks like a story but uh, I will take at least like a year think uh, at least I, I was actually 10 years thinking about this book wow and then I was like a year formulating it in my mind when I had decided to make it and then I wrote it in like a year and then after I had the first draft, I had had it for like a whole year, just like rewriting and uh, tweaking and uh, and kind of doing it. So I was was really happy with it. So um, so writing the writing process that I have, I, I'm not sure if I would be good at teaching my writing <laughs> process. <laughs> it's, well, it's it sounds not. very tailored to you and, yeah. and your needs and yeah. the way you think about yeah. the world and, yeah. and how you how you work. And, and I think that's that's the case for a lot of writers. You know, they, they've solved the problem of how do I write, but yeah. it's not a reproducible, you know, step one, step two, step no, three no, thing. No. So that makes sense. And, and uh, yeah. it's more important that you f- figure that out for yourself. You yeah. Know? So So like for me, Putting the book together, it was like uh, actually the fairy tale took over at one part. First, it was only a story that was in the um, a world where everybody got a time box and mm-hmm. they could like escape from anything, you know, the Mondays and the Februarys. But the king and the princess kind of came to me, and I, I was kind of tempted to write that just as a small chapter. It was just supposed to be a small fairy tale mm. within the story. But uh, there was something really tempting about, can you actually write, uh, almost uh, in a sincere way, about a king, yet again, <laughs> a king, yeah. a princess, and dwarves, you know, is that, and a casket. Can you actually write a story with those elements and still find a new way of writing about it? Yeah. And I thought it was uh, without taking like the uh, the sarcastic take on it or like the uh, postmodern take on the fairy tale, mm-hmm. but but kind of go almost full Shakespearean into the king, yeah. and uh, and also a princess is kind of a, a princess is kind of a lame thing, you know, like w- w- with full respect, <laughs> but you yeah, know, it, it's very diffi- difficult to write. Because, or, or traditionally, like a princess is kind of a, is, is not like a very good driving vehicle. Yeah, like the it, trope of it has been played in our minds so yeah, much yeah. that we have associations with it that yeah, may not be helpful. Yeah, so, yeah. and also I wanted to not make her like, uh, but I also did not like want to make like the brave princess either. So I just kind of, so I was kind of researching the princess almost as a, hostage hmm. or the princess as a situation or the princess as a, 
a metaphor for the maybe even the overprotected children of our time that have uh, don't have freedom anymore. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they don't. Right. The, the radius of a child has has been shrunk. Uh, dim has shrunk yeah. uh, dramatically, even since yeah. I was a child. Yeah, uh, they, me, they, me too. The, what, I think it's uh, helicopter parents. Uh, helicopter is the parenting. Phrase. Yeah. yeah. So, so you could say the 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 king is uh, the ultimate helicopter pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, totally. And, and he's, he has co total control that nothing will happen to the princess, and then he's obsessed that despite all this control, uh, he uh, time is still something that is he doesn't have any control of. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue to to start thinking about the book and its themes and characters, um, because really the book is is all about time, as you've mentioned. And so we have the king, king. So is it Demon? How do you? I want to. I want to know how you pronounce the names. It sounds like Simon. Simon Diamond. Diamond. Yeah. King Diamond. Like yeah. Jamie Diamond. Okay. Yeah, well, um, there's a mountain in Iceland called Demon. Oh, is there? Oh, okay. well, he's actually it's Demon in Icelandic. Like demon, like evil. Almost demon. like demon, yeah. Oh. But uh, but it's. I didn't want him to be demon because that would yeah. be... Yeah, again, that's associating. Yeah, it's yeah. too associating. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so King King Diamond, um, and then Obsidiana is the princess name. Yeah. So he really uh, tried to exercise this control, and time was the only thing he wanted to kind of manage, but you know he couldn't, like you were saying. I mean, so this book is all about time, and I think at a, at a broader level, I'm just curious to know about how you feel about time and how you think others feel about time both maybe within the book but also just our society how do we engage with time yes yeah, so like i come from iceland mm -hmm. and uh and you can feel time in maybe in many s different ways than normally you don't you can't take the sun for granted for example <laughs> like yeah so in the summertime we have the sun all day and all night, so you, you can read out, you know, it's just basically bright outside at midnight, and then come like the darker days, so we have this big contrast in the year. And then we have uh, geological forces that are both ancient, but also quick at the same time. So you could say that you have these ancient looking mountains, but then when you look closer, uh, some of them are actually younger than yourself. Hmm. That is, uh, and we would have a name competition even how to name a new lava field because it's uh, it's bigger than Manhattan or something. It just it, it was formed like five years ago. So wow. so so geolog and then we have geological forces now that are happening because of human intervention. That is, our glaciers are melting. That is, the, our glaciers have left geological speed and they're changing on a human speed. That is, things that used to change in a thousand years are happening now in a hundred years, or things that used to happen in a million years are changing in a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And then also, we are in the middle of the, we're like the Eura Eurasian and the uh, North American plates, mm -hmm. they meet in Iceland. So you can actually see where one s centimeter a year, one, one inch a year, yeah. uh, Iceland is being ripped apart. Oh, wow. So you can see the crack where, uh, where the continents are drifting apart. And, and I've always, and in Iceland, almost every natch, Iceland is very naked. It's not like covered with forest. So. Mm. So the, the geology is very visible. So you can really see, basically you can read the geology of the island. And, and very often the geology would be explained by folklore. So a big cliff would be a troll and there would be a story about this troll, how it turned to stone when it was trying to drag an island out to sea or something or or after the troll woman had eaten a priest, mm -hmm. she would be on her way to her lover with the remains of the priest in a bag or something kind of gruesome. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then the sun came up and, uh, and, uh, and she turned to stone. So, 
so I've always loved these kind of kind of almost like anachronic explanations. So like, of course, you know, the cliff is a million years old. Uh, but then there's a story that it actually happened in another time scale or in a, yeah. some kind of, of course, the memory of a fairy tale is not a million years. So when you look at the planet, and our planet is kind of created, or we started living on a planet maybe 500 years ago. Until then, we were just living in, you know, valleys and villages and nations. So, so we kind of just started living on a planet, maybe even not 500 years ago, maybe just 100 years ago. Right, that when, we when the population re really took off of humanity. Also when we just started to understand and have this speed of connection to the other sides of the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were things, and the overview effect that it was, we didn't see the planet, we didn't map the planet until a few hundred years ago. So I was kind of wondering, and it's actually less than 50 years ago, or 70 years ago, I, that, that the explanation of how South America and Africa used to be a single kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I thought, this has no explanation. <laughs> Nobody has explained to us in a story how mm -hmm. that great kingdom of Pangea actually was ruled by a king and how that big kingdom was split apart in a yeah. dramatic event. And also in Nordic mythology, uh, the world would be explained, also the creation of the world would be explained by the sky being the dwarf's helmet mm. and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the oceans being the blood of the giant or something. So I thought I wanted to bring some kind of those explanations, kind of, kind of some flavor of that into the story. If, if your readers do not know how South Africa and South America split, then now they, they, now they will. They will if they read the story. That's right. Yeah. It's all in there uh, in, in a somewhat gruesome way. But well, that's how all mythology that's actually. How all, yeah, that's very true. Um, I also thought, I mean, the, you touched on this, and there, there's kind of a, an environmental message throughout the book. In, in many different forms, yeah. both within the part of the book that takes place in our world, uh, you know, when everyone goes into their time boxes, nature kind of comes back, and there's yeah. it's overgrown with you know forests and animals, and they're sort of taking back their city, their yeah. space. Yeah. And uh, in the fable, the there were people that had the power to talk to the animals and command them and, and work with them and. And uh, as people learned that, they were told that they had to not use it for evil, essentially, and yeah. not, not use it to hurt other people. Yeah. And eventually that, that, uh, that was forgotten or that, that was ignored. And the king started to you know, take over the world by using these animals and, yeah. and kind of forcing them to do things, telling them what to do. And I thought in a very interesting way connected to how we use animals and, and, and that. So I just kind of wanted to, to plug in. And I know you mentioned your concerns for the environment. I mean, how, how did the characters in the story feel about their environment? And how did what happened in the story change that? Yeah, so there are two levels there. So actually, in one level where people decide to wait for better times, and times actually don't become better, so... So just basically the trees and nature kind of takes over mm -hmm. the cities and and actually at that point people can't really turn back because they've kind of formally uh, everything has kind of grown over. So actually the old woman that has not been taking part in this, she actually wonders if things are getting worse <laughs> or they're actually just getting better yeah, <laughs> yeah. When, when, when people are not... Uh, ruining any everything anymore, and so it's also maybe maybe I'm also asking myself because I, I, I am actually a human also. So I'm, and and in some way I'm also kind of part of the problem, and uh, so I'm in some way it's this question of balance between 
using nature or using inventions or using technology and then abusing nature mm. and with that technology and so i think the story is the message is not like a direct metaphor for global warming or, or like it, it's more about balance of uh, of inventions technology and and how are we ever able to get something new a gadget or a, a car or something and actually use it with some kind of sensibility are we always doomed to make a traffic jam out of it and and uh, and make a parking lot where the nesting place of <laughs> of a rare animal is you know are we able to will we ever be able to find some kind of balance so mm -hmm. so i think also the pact that the king kind of uh, betrays w when he gets the secret to work with animals but he has this he just may not use animals against other people when he starts doing that and he feels the power that he gets of course that is in some way what what we are doing now maybe using the, the fossil fuels or something but and and eventually seems to be that we are according to science actually not according to my own my own that is scientists have declared basically that we are we are creating the big mass extinction so of course yeah. that is something that inspires and that is actually a symbol of living very mythological times that is when scientists have actually said you know that we are have become a geological force that could both destroy the animals on our planet and that could actually come back to destroying ourselves right yeah exactly uh, one thing I also wanted to think through was this idea of what happened to Obsidiana, what happened to the princess. You know, as she was growing up, she grew up without a mom. And, you know, for a time, the king was normal and, or I guess, <laughs> at least lucid and not insane. And then she, he kind of went away. You know, he wanted to take over the world and it was going to be for her. And so she was with other people. She grew up without him. And then he started putting her in the casket. And she eventually, you know, she would get out for little bits and pieces. Sometimes he was there. For there were long periods in which he wasn't. So she essentially had to make sense of her world without a lot of guidance from her father. Um, maybe she would get letters and, or, or whatever. But it wasn't really clear. And then, like you said, he, he kind of went crazy. Um, I think... There are a lot of people out there that are that are dealing with situations in which there's a single parent or their parents and them aren't connecting. How does Obsidiana make sense of the situation she's in in terms of her lack of a sort of parental guidance? And, and how do you think readers reading your book might, might uh, think about that for themselves? I think it was also like... Uh if you if you read about the the tech giants or something like mm -hmm. or or just kind of i think i was thinking about this ambition in general mm. like uh, when you want to achieve something in the people that have and and i would say the uh, the tragedy of ambition of accomplishment that is people that have which is kind of also the the big story of our times, which is, you know, the American dream or, or the, or now it's like the Silicon Valley dream that is, yeah. you know, like uh, accomplishing everything, kind of transitioning uh, technology or something. And we see these people being totally absorbed by an idea, uh, by a single goal, and they almost sacrifice everything for that. So uh, and also I had these we had had this period in Iceland where uh, the when the banking boom was taking place and uh, I was reading these interviews with these bankers and they would leave their house uh, six in the morning 
they would come home after the children had fallen asleep. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was like thinking, okay, what is this success? What is this drive? Yeah. What What is the point of that? And then when everything collapsed, the economy, that kind of sacrificed six years of their children's lives, but everything they had accomplished was kind of in ruins. So I think I was inspired by by those those things and this kind of idea of of uh, being able to buy the best for somebody instead of uh, that is that relationship is not something that you can buy, mm -hmm. but it was just kind kind of buying everything for her and uh, and I was thinking of this kind of maybe loneliness in luxury or or this excess of everything and maybe how hollow and shallow that is uh, and then that goes into maybe the idea of fame because he becomes like a goddess and what is that worth being worshipped yeah and she's like and her uh, or kind of old wise man asks if it's uh, better to be uh, loved by one or were worshipped by a million people, and um, so so strangely it seems like it's many themes, but it's yeah. it's it's like these themes become like a consequence of maybe a single action. So it kind of mm -hmm. they kind of and and so they're all kind of rooted within the same. They're rooted as a consequence of a single action, yeah. And uh, and I was also reading these interviews also with maybe these uh, very affluent children that actually had not met their parents <laughs> for a long time. And uh, I'm not advocating against uh, parents working or <laughs> or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, But uh, but I was maybe it's, it's a balance again. Yeah, uh, but but uh, yeah, again a, a balance. And and why is he? What is actually the point of of conquering the world? But but actually, because that is the metaphor, that is the highest success level of our times. That is that is eventually what you want to do when you finish business school. Right. <laughs> is, is to to eventually stumble upon. Yeah, be and Jeff and Bezos own Amazon. Yeah, yeah, you want to you want to be that, and uh, yeah. and then then the question is why do you want to be that and then of course maybe an artist you know do i want to be uh, you know so i'm like uh, it's also it's also embedded maybe in the art also you know the, yeah. the success of the bestseller and and maybe a uh, self reflection on uh, my own ambition so mm. so is this is this what I want to become? Like, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's like, an interesting do, do paradox. I want to, do I want to go on a world book tour and not see my kids <laughs> for, a, yeah. for a year? Right. So. Which again, you'll have you could have millions of people reading the book. Yeah. But what you know, at what cost? Yeah. yeah. So that's exactly a, that's exactly it, and yeah, that's a tricky one. So so of course it's not only pointed at somebody else, but it, maybe it's also pointed inwards. Yeah. And um, but I also thought it was a. I just thought it was a kind of also an interesting theme and a way of creating this terribly lonely princess that and she is so important that uh, that lots of children are they go through these tests if they're worthy enough to be your friend and and uh, and everybody fails the test because yeah. nobody's of brilliant course. enough to be your friend. Well, and she also she also has all these advisors kind of around her, making decisions for her, yeah. um, especially making decisions for her while she's in the casket. Interestingly, about what's good or what's bad, and how to understand what her expression means. Um, but I want to ask about Excel, uh, specifically E X E L, um, as this character that initially comes to the king kind of out of nowhere and, and says, "I can turn I think air into gold," and does so, and kind of becomes the king's economic advisor. Um, it's a very interesting character because throughout the book, it's not always clear, you know, the allegiance that Excel holds and 
um, sort of the ending of the character is, is, in, is maybe not what people might have predicted, and I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so I guess I'm just curious to know, you know, this, this type of person, uh, th within the fable, they're sort of the economic advisor, but there's also a clear kind of real world connection that, that we were mentioning in terms of someone that understands the way the economy works. And so I was just curious about how we might want to think about those people, how the characters in the story try and, you know, respond to Excel and, and how we think about our interactions with the people that try and explain the way the economy and, and money work to us. Yeah, I, I thought it was tempting to make like um, an, a new, uh, to try, to try to find a new archetype that is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I actually thought this character didn't actually have an archetype. So I was thinking, why is the Excel spreadsheet called Excel? Because often things are called, you know, they're named after a mythological <laughs> yeah. being, you know, you could have a computer program called, uh, I don't remember, like... Uh, like Jupiter, so Jupiter yeah, is a Yeah, Jupiter, Jupiter or, 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 is a or Bluetooth, program. which is, a, which is a, actually a Norwegian king. Yeah. And uh, so I was thinking, why is Axel called Axel? And, and there was no real explanation. So I would maybe kind of reverse engineer mm. <laughs> why Axel is called Axel. Yeah. And, uh, also, it, I thought it was a funny anachronism for the story. So, not to be true to some kind of uh, m medieval kingdom thing, but make a quirky remark to our own times and maybe our own workplaces. Mm -hmm. So, so Excel, he's like this kind of a mindless calculator. He's he's brilliant but he doesn't see any kind of limits to his calculations, which, of course, the economists of our current world, uh, while we know that limited, unlimited economic growth is not possible on a limited planet, uh, still the, that is used as like a whip on politicians and on the economy and on the work kind of on everything that we should just expand, 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 and grow, and grow, and grow. Mm -hmm. Even though, and th they do not take into the Excel sheets the, the, the kind of fundamentals of the consequences. Yeah. So, in a way, um, Excel is uh, the advisor of unlimited growth without consequences. And also like this kind of uh, kind of uh, the calculation without philosophical nuances and the uh, the kind of the kind of questions of of questioning yourself why and how and 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 also this kind of boxed type of thinking of 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 of, of, a, of a single goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he he becomes the king's advisor, and he kind of calculates how he can accomplish conquering the world. So instead of punishing his enemies, he he arms them and gives them gold and medals and r turns them around right. to the another nation. And uh, so he has this kind of great formula of how to kind of manipulate the world into into becoming the great kingdom of Pangea under a single king. And eventually, of course, yeah, that has some consequences. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spoiler alert. Things happen yeah. uh, once you try to take over the world. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to also think about Anarai, the, the boy that we had mentioned earlier that sort of sneaks in to see the princess when she's frozen in her casket and um, initially tries to rob her and, and wakes her up and, and they develop a relationship. And, and, uh, and one of the things that the princess asks for is kind of a report on what's going on. So at every full moon, she kind of wants to know, you know what, what's happening out in the world because she doesn't get to see it. And when Anna arrives in the village uh, and starts asking these questions, 
he gets a lot of uh, brush off and sort of everything's fine. The, you know, the world is great. The king's great. You know, don't don't worry. You know, don't don't think about it. And I think as I was reading the book, I sort of realized that's kind of what everybody is getting to some extent. You know, there's a lot of misinformation being sent around. The people are being misinformed about what Obsidiana the princess is up to. Um, there's a lot of people controlling information in, in interesting ways and. I thought there was a lot of parallels between that and the world we live in today and how people in power control information and try and use that as a way of furthering their, their own ends. Um, so I guess I'm just curious about, you know, why, why that seems to happen. Why, you know, to the extent that, is that, is that actually necessary for, in order for people to succeed if the goal is to have a prosperous kingdom? Is it important to misinform people? You know, how, how do the characters in the book deal with all of that, and how should we, knowing that we're probably not getting the whole truth? Yeah, we're, we're living in the world of fake news, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also uh, click news that is... Clickbait? Yeah, kind that. of the... Uh, yeah. The most viral news becomes mm -hmm. what is what spreads, and and uh, of course, this is a symptom of any regime and any kingdom, and also maybe when it's failing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that then then uh, they have to take more control over. Uh, probably the Eastern Bloc did not have to take as much control over the media in the first kind of phases of, of when things were growing and maybe going okay in a way. But so I was yet uh, just wanted to put this, you know, if you have a kingdom, then of course he has to have some control of the, and he also use, finds that religion becomes uh, an important, like people's um, kind of mindless belief in something that he can uh, harness that as well so so in a strange way the princess becomes like a vehicle for the kingdom and i also like exploring these dilemmas so actually she has become maybe just like a maybe i could even have been inspired by britney spears or something i was reading an article <laughs> that yeah. the people around her were didn't really care of her mental health they just needed her to go on stage so they could yeah. harness harness more money. That was like the many image. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. or, or, or just children prodigies. And, uh, uh, but then, of course, uh, the, the news and the rumors. I, I, I really love folklore. Yeah. So I, I was also putting in elements of how stories change, how, how stories spread, where a story comes from, and then, of course, she could, we could have both kind of, both the public view of the story, but we would also know the story itself. Yeah. So there are lots of stories within the story that are woven in. And, and I also think that, but it was also inspired by kind of real events, like, uh, I got a rare opportunity. I, I spoke twice with the Dalai Lama. I met him oh, wow. two times for like one hour. And that was kind of interesting. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. Not kind of interesting. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, what did you guys talk about? Well, basically everything. It, interviewing yeah. him is like uh, an interview rodeo. Yeah. Because he just jumps all around and he goes high and low and mm -hmm. laughs and tells you something quite... Uh, deep and thoughtful and, and sad even. And and of course, he's like a mythological character. Like, yes. you know, he's like a, uh, like a god, but if it's not, 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 that term is not used. And, um, but reading also about his life uh, when he was a child, he, uh, he, uh, he, kind of wanted just to be a normal boy. <laughs> you know, he, he was like yeah. a young, restless monk, and uh, he was just chosen to be this. And, and he, did, he didn't ask for it. He didn't ask for it, no, yeah. but, and he didn't always want it. And, and, and in some ways, kind of reading about such a child is tragic in some way, but, but it's, of course, his life as a 
Farmer poem might not have been uh, so great either in, in a very poor rural village. And, and he got to know Mao, that unified China, mm -hmm. and eventually uh, was kept in a glass casket. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but but uh, <laughs> I'm not using all these references one on one, but I, uh, I think my life or the times that I was living, uh, meeting the Dalai Lama, and he was telling me how he saw Mao as almost as a father figure. Hmm. Uh, he looked really up to him, and he eventually overtook his kingdom, and he ran into exile. Uh, we had the gods, economic gods in Iceland, rising, flying too close to the sun, collapsing. Yeah, and then driven to exile. Driven right? to exile I as think well. Iceland was one of the few countries that actually prosecuted criminally some of the bankers. Yeah, yeah, we were. I think so. One of the few. And uh, doing very similar things that they were doing here, in the yeah. and you could just also see how gods were created, yeah. like how how people got this mystical status. Mm. Then uh, we had this volcanic eruption that basically disrupted the world. Actually, the world flights all kind of in 2010 when we had this big eruption, and uh, and I went up there and I saw a volcanic eruption for the first time, like. Uh, like really close. Yeah, uh, and not I, too close. Yeah, well, I actually had some lava in my shovel. So, wow. <laughs> so I was, uh, I, I was, I was very, I was, I, I was at the lava front and, and I had never heard, seen lava before. I, I thought it would rumble. Yeah. But the strange thing, because that's what you would see in the documentaries. Right, it sound, it looks and sounds terrifying. It's yeah, coming yeah, at but you. But actually, uh, a, a vo active volcano is not is actually seducing hmm. in sound because it's of course it's molten rock it is so it's not anything hard banging against anything hard it's a soft thing ah so is it so flowing like water kind of no or? so basically the the pool itself that is the lava sprout itself uh, almost sounded like a, like an ultrasound when you take your baby to mm -hmm. you were expecting a child so it was this who who Ooh, the, the, mm. like this breathing, yeah, breathing, soft breathing sound because it's like floating rock that is bursting and landing on floating rock, floating rock. So it's a it's a liquid. So it and it creates this woofer. So it's like this woofer, woo, 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 and and, and, yeah. and, it, and it and it doesn't tell you to go away. <laughs> it tells you lulls it, you it, in. It tells you bit. to come closer. Ooh. Which is kind dangerous. of dangerous. Yeah. So we went all the way to the lava front. And that's actually uh, because what is formed on the surface of lava is glass. So that sounded like a uh, hundred million bottles being broken at the same time. So it's mm. this cracking sound of, of because it's always forming glass on the surface and then it's breaking. So it's just like a like a like a thousand tons of Grass, glass being slowly broken and moving towards you. Wow! And then it has this. And you stood there. Yeah, for I stood all there. This. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, that of course inspired this idea. You know, why do I have to take a million years for uh, Pangea to rip apart? Couldn't that just, just happen, happen as an e event? Yeah. And then it grows over. So right. I was basically taking everything that was happening maybe from 2002 to 2013 in my life. I had uh, three children at that time. I have four in total. It's also just thinking a lot about children's culture, children's mm -hmm. literature. And then before that, I had been working in the Manuscript Institute in Iceland. So the same day my son was born, I had in my hands the original copy of the Codex Regius, which is the uh, the original manuscript of the Poetic Edda. Oh wow! Which is what Marvel Comics is is using now for all of their Thor movies, and mm -hmm. and this is what Wagner was using in Tolkien and uh, Borges, and and I was so starstruck that I was having like this, it's like 
having uh, Elvis in my hands or something. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like one of the big kind of the fundaments of uh, of uh, the world culture. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of having that manuscript in my hands the, a whole summer. And so actually much of the mythological thinking in the book is taken directly from, not from a book, <laughs> actually from from the original 800 year manuscript yeah. where I could, where again big events would happen like in the Ragnarök, the apocalypse, so the fall of the gods, so Sol Tier Sortna, Sigur Fold Imar, Kverva of Himni Heidar Stjörnur, Geysar Eimi with Altur Nara. So, so you would have this apocalypse in a single paragraph, mm. like in, in six lines or something, in a poem. It's and dense. It's so dense, yes. Yeah. So, so the density in my book is also kind of, and I was thinking, what makes ideas and things live? Like the Bible, all of the creation stories are like 15 pages or something. It's like Adam, Eve, Noah, all that stuff. This infinite inspiration. So, so then my, and then that goes again to time. That is, if you look at, uh, I have still a grandfather alive and a grandmother, and we are, they are born in the twenties. And if I think about my daughter becoming as old as my grandfather, then she's still alive in the year two thousand. Uh, and six, no, two thousand one hundred yes. and six. Twenty second century. Uh, yeah. So actually, you're having children is sci-fi, right? And, they they and see the future. Yeah, and uh, just thinking about the future of your child is sci-fi. While before, at the time when this manuscript was written, people were living in a different cycle. That is, they were living in this cycle where they would expect their grandchild to live a very similar lifestyle and life right. as their own grandfather. Hmm. And then my grandparents' stories are kind of strange because uh, uh, my grandfather was a surgeon here in New York mm -hmm. and he operated on Oppenheimer. Oh, wow. The, the father of the nuclear yeah, bomb. Yeah. So he actually encountered the true person of the 20th century that is like a, a Prometheus. Yeah. So Prometheus went to the highest mountain and came down with fire to empower humans. But Oppenheimer went into the smallest, came out with the atomic bomb yeah. and created gods out of our leaders that could, with one button, destroy the planet. Yeah. So all these things, almost surreal things in my own life, you know, <laughs> Dalai Lama, Oppenheimer, all this. Children, stuff, yeah, know, yeah. Children, uh, mythology. They're all uh, coming together. So I kind of just draw it in and, and then of course try to make some sense of it into a story. Yeah, I think that's a great way of thinking about the book. Um, just to wrap things up, because I think that was a, an, an excellent closeout, uh, were, there, were there any other big ideas or concepts or themes that you hoped either children or adults would take away from this book that we haven't talked about? Uh, I just also think as a child I think it's also like a philosophical experience. Mm -hmm. It's it's more a philosophical experience than a lesson. That is, I'm not saying like pointing a finger. You you should look at Mondays as good day. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just the philosophical idea that you're a child, you're reading a book, and so some suddenly on the pages somebody is questioning something that you didn't uh, notice before. You know, mm -hmm. what if I could remove the Mondays? You know, so all these what ifs, which is fun for a kid. Yeah. You know, you're nine or ten or 50, 15 or something, you, and 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 just suddenly, wow, yeah, what if that would happen? And and just so it's also just a tribute to literature and imagination and uh, and basically. Uh, so even th and I think having a f a theme in a book or or a message or something. That's always very interwoven just in the way I write. So I, I find it difficult to make a book where I just make a villain and he steals something and that's what is at stake. <laughs> you know, right. you know, like I, you know, okay, why should I do that? 
I, I, I like much more like uh, coming at the story from a more fundamental base. Yeah. Uh, so about time, about it's about as fundamental as you can get. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I think I think you pulled that yeah, off. Yeah. If that was the goal. Um, all right. Well, let's do a thunder round and close out with just some fun questions, and uh, and we'll call it a day. Yeah. All right. So, what is your favorite food or drink? Uh, I, actually, Icelandic fish and okay. water. <laughs> Sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, Where is your favorite place you've ever been? I would say. Uh, one of my favorite places is an island off the coast of Sicily called Ustica. Ustica. Yep. Okay. Sicily, yep. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Wow, that's like a that's that's like the world peace question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's your wand. But yeah, I, I say like I was. I I think I answered that when I was nine, and I would say world peace. World peace. Yeah. Done. All right, Andre, thank you so much for joining. The book again, The Casket of Time, Andre Magnuson. The book was amazing, as I'm sure you all could tell. And um, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. Mm-hmm.